All right, 2 Kings chapter 15, uh, this morning a message titled, Blessed in 2020, you know, and I know that might seem somewhat counterintuitive, right, if we think about uh, what's going on in, in 2020, you, you hear uh, so much talk about the, the challenges, right, and it can be easy to get focused on that, there's plenty of them, right, you hear so much about the changes, and you know, so much question about the future, and, and those, those are reasonable uh, questions, uh, to have given the, the magnitude of, of the things that have been going on. And it's not like pre-COVID was easy. I mean, if you think about it, right? And you, you it, not to bring up bad memories, but remember the whole impeachment thing at the beginning of the year, kind of the highlight of the political turmoil for a number of years, right? And, and, and then all of this unrest, which, which brings it, it pretty close to home, uh, perhaps when we think of, you know, personal safety, which we don't... Um, most of us don't have to lose a lot of sleep over, right? We're blessed in great communities and great leadership and great law enforcement. And, and, and we're, we don't really frequently have to think about, uh, most of us, our own personal safety. But now that's been a little bit more uh, in our face with some of the things that, that have gone on. So it can be easy to think, man, I, and I mean, I, I get it, you know, how much longer till 2021? <laughs> you know what I mean? When is this going to be over? And as if all of a sudden on December 31st, everything's going to stop, which I'm not sure the wisdom in, in thinking that. But um, what, I want, what I want to encourage us in is the hope that we have here in the midst of it, right? And how blessed we truly are if, if we really think about the great blessings that are in Christ, right? Which, which is uh, different than just circumstantial peace or circumstantial blessing. It's, it's a blessed hope that we have in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, you know, sometimes as we read through the scriptures, we, we learn uh, what to do based on examples from people in the word, right? And other times we learn what not to do, <laughs> right, By, based on examples from people in the word. And so, but, but in both cases, in fact, God has told us that that's part of the reason that he's left these things for our example for us to learn. And in some cases it is, uh, you know, a positive uh, example other times maybe it's not positive but nevertheless principles that we can apply to our lives and so we're going to do that uh, today and and as we study through the history especially of the northern kingdom remember there's there's two kingdoms now the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom referred to as Judah and Israel Samaria sometimes for the northern kingdom generally speaking the kings of the north uh, we read that they they did not walk in the ways of the Lord Right? They, and as a result, you see a lot more turnover in leadership. You see a lot uh, more trouble, right? It's just as, as whenever, when we choose to have extended periods of time, you know, you make decisions contrary to the things of God. Things don't tend to go as well as when you choose to, to follow the Lord. And, and the southern kingdom was, by, was uh, not perfect by any means, but, but you read a lot more frequently that the king walked in the ways of the Lord, right? And so, uh, in some cases, longer reigns. And so... We're getting into a few chapters where there's a lot of turnover, right? That's one thing. As an employer, you know, if you notice a lot of turnover, you kind of have to wonder, uh, are we doing things the way we should do, right? And, and so, uh, or maybe is there a, a cultural problem of some sort? And so, um, uh, here are a lot, of tur- or in a lot of turnover in the kings, particularly in the north. And so... Um, Let's pick it up in, in verse 1, and, and our, our principle that we're going to apply here from uh, 1 Kings, the first uh, number of, of verses, is, is that, you know, being blessed in 2020, right, in order to thrive, right, not only survive, and, and, and I know a lot of us are, are just happy to survive 2020, right, but, but I want to go beyond that and thrive, and there's no reason we can't thrive in 2020. In fact, I mean, if you look at the, and, and it's interesting talking about this even going back many years, often the church thrives in times of persecution, right? Often as difficulty and challenge comes to the church, the church thrives. And so in order to thrive, we'll see here, in order to thrive, be faithful at what God has called you, called you to, right? And work within his will. This is going to be a situation where we see a, a learn a lesson of what not to do, based on what what we see in the in the text here, right? 
So in order to thrive, be faithful to what God has called you to and work within his will. Don't try to be what, we're, what you're not called to be. Right? And we'll, we'll see that here. So in the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, so the north, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, the south, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years. Right? So again, some of the longer reigns, uh, because we read here, his mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So here we are in the southern kingdom, a king as a very young person, which, which, is, which should be encouraging to, to young people, right? And, and something we can encourage the young people in our lives, right? God can use us at any age, right? You think of, of Paul's exhortations to Timothy, right? To be faithful and to be an example even in our youth. And so at the age of 16, he comes to the throne and he generally does what is right in the Lord's eyes according to all that his father Amaziah had done. And so, uh, again, we see those uh, longer reigns. We're going to read of, you know, reigns of six months, reigns of two years, 52 years. That's pretty solid, right? And so verse 4, nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. So, although he generally did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, he still didn't remove the high places, right? Remember, this was set up really as compromise, right? Way back in the times of Jeroboam, if I remember correctly, right? Where, where he set up these high places to uh, mimic or, or to really provide an alternative to worshiping where God wanted them to, and that was in Jerusalem, right? Because he wanted to keep people in the north, concern that they might see life in, in the south and, and, and either live there or try to allow the king of the south to uh, have control of the entire uh, land. So, verse 4, right, the high places weren't taken away, and as a result, the people still sacrificed. So, unfortunately, verse 5 says, And the Lord touched the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate, separate house. Now, we, we know from Chronicles, right, that... Uh, he generally did what was right in the Lord's sight, and he did that for much of his life. Um, and as a result, he was blessed. And he became a little proud or, or puffed up in, in his success, which is something that uh, can be tempting and can be easy to do. And he chose to go into the altar and himself wanted to offer, sacri offer sacrifices on the altar, burnt offering on the altar, right? And, and the priests opposed him, because it's, that was not to be uh, a job of the king, but, but he uh, insisted on doing it anyways, right? And as a result of that, God struck him as a, letter, uh, as a leper. So towards the end of, of, or later on in his life, right, God uh, struck him as a leper to the day of his death, and that was uh, an unfortunate sentence, a very sad sentence, right? They were, we, we read here, um, to the day of his death, he lived in a separate house, and Jotham, the king's son, was over the household, governing the people of the land. So, you know, the, the sentence of leprosy would mean you couldn't touch anybody, right? Lest you, you pass that on, you would be distanced from people. And so uh, here, in fact, his son sort of took over the, the affairs. Uh, but again, it was because he was trying to perform the duties of a priest, which he wasn't to do. He was called to be a king, and he was doing a nice job at it, right? He was generally following the ways of the Lord. He, he missed the mark in terms of the high places, but it was because of him stepping out of his role and trying to uh, do what God had not called him to do, and that is the duties of a priest, which only priests should do, that he was struck with leprosy. Now the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did are then now written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah. The answer is yes. That's sort of a rhetorical question. And Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. And so, so again, he didn't stick to just what God had called him to do and what he was generally doing a nice job at, right? And, and, and it's important to know how, uh, how we're gifted, right, how we're called. If you, you know, want to chat about how you know, there's some general ways to sort of discover that. Right, one, of the, one of the great things is to step out in faith and, 
and see, you know, what are you passionate about? What do you uh, get positive feedback on? What do you generally see uh, uh, success at? What do you see yourself doing? Um, you know, the Bible says that God works in us to will and to do, right? And so, and then step out and, and try it. But we can chat about that if you like at, at another time. But um, work, you know, work to develop the gifts and, and the skills that God has given you. Uh, and, 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 you know, a lot, of, a lot of strife can come from trying to be what we're not called to be, right? A lot of uh, challenge. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, right? My burden is light. And so uh, do our best to operate, right, within uh, what, uh, what God has called us to do and stay humble, right? Again, uh, the king here was, was puffed up, no doubt, partly because of the success that he had seen. Right, and he and he stepped out into an area that he shouldn't have. Let's jump over to Matthew chapter eleven in the New Testament. Matthew chapter eleven, towards the end of the chapter in verse twenty-eight, we're going to see a good principle here. You know, and some people, uh, you know, can. I think an error, perhaps try to use this to, well, if it's hard, don't do it. That's not the idea, right? God calls us to work hard. Colossians chapter 3, read that, right? You know, we're called to work hard. Uh, Paul exhorts Timothy to, to kind of work hard at his craft, how God has called him and, and gifted him, and so we should do that, right? You know, God gives us gifts, but he doesn't force us, right? We, we step out and we, we pray and we exercise those gifts, and and, and depending on what it may be, we work hard, right, to, to fine-tune it. But here, in Matthew chapter 20, uh, 11, verse 28, he says, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And this is the word there, yoke, my, my, my training, basically, right? There, there's two ways that a yoke would have been thought of in the minds of the people at the time. One, of course, would have been two oxen side by side, you know, in a farming situation with the yoke over their shoulders, and it would go to the others. And often, the way they would train a younger ox, put it next to an older ox, and they would learn how to walk, and, and a lot easier than trying to push down, or they still have to go behind and push down, but a lot easier to have the force of, the strength of the ox right there. And so, but the yoke being the, the, the bond between them and, and, and being trained. But also, if you were under the yoke of a, of a rabbi or of a, of a teacher, Right, that being a disciple is, is, is the idea of having, you know, you're under their yoke, you're under their training. And so Jesus says that his yoke is easy and, and his burden is like, so take my yoke or my, my training, be my disciple. Right, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and learn from me. Right, it makes sense, right? Yoke is, is training, so learn from Jesus for he is gentle and lowly in heart. And, and I think it's so tragic that so many today have, have a thought of, of, of Jesus as this, you know, a, a, a mean God, right? Someone out to get us when, when he is so loving. John, one of my favorite verses says that, that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. So often people think God just wants to condemn us. But no, he didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that through his son, the world might be saved. Why is that? Because we need saving. I don't know how people can dispute that. The more time goes on even. How can anybody dispute? The world desperately needs to be saved. And it's one heartbeat, one person at a time, as people choose to uh, humble themselves and follow Jesus. And I've shared before, that's, that's really the hope for, for our nation, is, is people who will surrender themselves to God, follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and do what is right because it's right in God's sight. Right? It's, you know, we look around for leadership and we look around for, uh, you know, consistent, you know, there's a time where you could generally point to, you know, leaders of our country, generally speaking, for, for some direction. Now, there, you know, it's, it's such polar opposites, literally. I encourage everybody, vote, get out and vote, right? There's a lot uh, at stake. Vote biblical principles, right? That, that, that makes it pretty clear, in my opinion. You know, get out and vote because it's, it, it's crucial. But at the end of the day, we need hearts to change, right? We need revival in our land. And, and, and it's tragic that so many think that, that God is a, a judging God or a, a God that's just here to, to cause us not to have any fun or a, a good life. I mean, the, 
And I, you know, I, I lived almost 25 years uh, outside of God's plan. You know, I mean, God was at work, thank God, in that. But I, I, I didn't really surrender, make my own personal decision for Christ till I was almost 25 years old. I remember, actually, the day after I got saved, I, I was at a retreat, um, and uh, Pastor Raw had had shared about uh, Elijah. In fact, a guy in the Old Testament who who lived for the Lord. And I realized, you know, I believe, I believe in God. I, I grew up, by and large, believing in the Lord and, and everything, but I, I really didn't surrender my life. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I heard uh, a, a guy was at the retreat that both my sister and brother actually worked for for a number of years. And he, he was talking about um, uh, how kind of this idea of, of you know, following Jesus. And, and he said, you know, I've had more fun since I became a Christian than before I was a Christian, and I, you know, I'd been saved 12 hours, and I thought, you must have had a boring life, <laughs> because I was, I was kind of all in, I mean, I was, I was, you know, learning, and I remember a week before that, talking to a friend who, you know, I raised a lot of eyebrows with, um, and I said, you know, I don't really, you know, care about this born-again explicative stuff, all I want to, I want to find peace, you know, and I had, a, I, I had a pretty good life, to be honest with you. I mean, as far as, you know, the world stuff goes. Um, and, and so, but I remember thinking about uh, when this guy was talking. You know, I probably should repent to him if I ever see him again. But um, uh, you must have had a boring life. I mean, you know, my, my view of Christianity. But here I am, you know, 27 plus years later. And I can tell you, I've had more fun as a Christian than all the craziness before, and and again, I had a, I had a, a a pretty good life, you know. But and and it's not because of of adrenaline. I mean, that that, that can be cool too, I, I guess. But like, um, it, it's it's just that that contentment in the Lord, that peace in the Lord, that you that joy in the Lord that you you can't replace uh, really anywhere that that we might try to, and and so it, it's so tragic when. People think that God is just this hard, charging, driving, mean, you know, man upstairs who's out to get us. Jesus says, I'm gentle and lowly or humble is the idea in heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's, that's who invites us to come to him, to, to follow him, right? To surrender our lives to him. And that means to his plan, his will for us. And it is awesome. So let's jump back over to our, to our uh, study, right? So remember, in order to thrive, be faithful to what God has called you to do, right? Work within his will, right? His plan for you. And, and his will is outlined in the scriptures, right? We learn principles, right? There, there's things that uh, over time of learning about the Lord, we don't really necessarily have to pray about, you know? I get mad at, at, at someone on the road. I don't have to pray about whether I should shoot them, right? I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer, right? I don't have to pray about that. I don't, I don't I have to pray about running them off the road, right? That, that's, that's not the right thing to do. I know that, right? You know, and so we learn. Those are, are obviously extreme examples. I'm in a rush to, you know, go see Ashley in Iowa City. I don't have to pray about should I drive 120, even if it's during the pandemic, to get over there, right? That's just wrong, right? There's certain things that, that, that we you know, again, kind of extreme examples, but that, that as we draw near the Lord, we, we understand the principles of following the Lord. And so we, there's other things we pray about, right? And, and pray about everything, you know, in all things, right? And in all, in all times, but like um, uh, learning principles, right? So of operating within God's will, right? And as we, as we, come to more challenging issues, it might cause us to dig deeper into God's Word, right? To, to seek out counsel, to, to go to prayer, right? But, but don't try to be what God has not called you to be, right? Operate within His plan for you. And secondly, let's pick it up in verse uh, 8, right? And, and we'll read through uh, verse 18. In the, in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, right? So remember, they're often referred back and forth, right, to the reigns of various kings. So in the 38th year of Judah, uh, uh, of Azariah, uh, 38th of his 52 years, 
Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned over in Israel six months. <laughs> so uh, hopefully he didn't put a lot of stock in, in being king, right? Because that didn't last very, very long. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, and as, as his fathers had done, he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him down at Ibelium and put him to death and reigned in his place. Being a king was um, uh, a dangerous job. I was just talking with uh, someone from work a couple weeks ago. Her son uh, worked out on the, the wells, right? You know, the oil wells out, out in the deep ocean. And, and he, I've, and I've wondered about this, you know, it's just interesting how jobs you aren't aware of. I've, I've heard of the, the guys that go down and, like, you know, bridges, they need servicing, you know, down underwater. And, you know, the, the, that's way down there, and guys go down in these big suits. And not just the scuba gear, right? You can go down so many feet in that, but they go way down. Well, this guy serviced oil wells 2,500 feet underwater in, like, a Michelin man suit. And they're down there for, like, 24 hours. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking about nerves of steel. I, I, that would not be for me, right? And um, interestingly, they have a 10% death rate. So if you take that job, one in 10 people are going to die. Not so much, you know, being eaten by, by, you know, a great white shark or something, but just because of the going up and down and the pressure and not getting that right, one in 10 people die of, of, of related effects. I can't imagine the work comp rates for that. But, uh, sorry, um, but uh, one in 10, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, pretty steep. And so talk about a, a, a dangerous and, I mean, he had, he had actually was on track to be a Navy SEAL and they discovered some medical thing, so he couldn't do that. So obviously he had some pretty solid nerves of steel, but, but 2,500 feet, I, mean, I, I doubt there's even any natural light down that far, you know, and anyways. Being a king in Israel was pretty dangerous too. Six months, right? And, and they ran through kings pretty frequently. Now the rest of the deeds of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This was the promise of the Lord that he gave to Jehu, your son shall sit on the throne to Israel to the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. And so again, that promise, right, that God, uh, God had kept to him, right? And so Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the 39th year of Uzziah. King of, king of Judah, and he reigned one month in Samaria. One month. Then Menahem, the son of Gadi, came up from Terzah and came to Samaria, and he struck down Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria, and put him to death, and he reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Shalom and the conspiracy that he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. At that time, Menahem sacked Tiphah and uh, all who were in its territory from Terzah on because they did not open it to him. Therefore, he sacked it and he ripped open all the women in it who were pregnant. Just terrible, brutal, brutal people. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, the son of Gadi, began to reign over Israel and he reigned 10 years in Samaria and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from, uh, depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made him to sin. Right, we talked a little bit last week about um, Jonah. Right, and why he was so opposed to this uh, 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 going to Nineveh and, the, and just the, the Assyrian. We see how brutal. Another thing that's interesting to me uh, that they would do to exercise control over territories that they were uh, trying to, or not trying to, that they had conquered, um, and to remove any sense of, of kind of... Um, you know, identity in, in the people. One thing they would do is force people to move. They, they would go into an, a nation that they were going to occupy, and they would take people from that nation and bring them back to uh, uh, their, their land, and, and, and vice versa. And they would sort of, sort of integrate. It's interesting to me that that's also on the ballot coming in November. I mean, that general idea, right, of, of forcing um, communities, right, to, to merge, which is, which is interesting to me. Right, it was it was it's not the first time in history, right? That that uh, and and I'm all for what I would call you know dynamic or natural organic, uh, uh, which frankly you know is happening in our country, right? I mean all people moving and 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 being where, but not being forced. But that's on the ballot too. I don't know if you're aware of that, 
the idea of forcing uh, communities to, to, to come together and targeting, frankly, the suburbs. Right? That's, that's the main focus of, of what's been on the ballot under the prior president or been on the agenda under the prior president and is very much on the ballot this time. And it's interesting that it was done out of a mean, as a means of controlling people. And so just a brutal people, we understand why Jonah was hesitant to want to go and, 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 and preach repentance. As we read in the book of Jonah, he was afraid they would repent, and he was afraid that God would be merciful to them, which he was. Right? They, they repented, the king repented, and God was merciful, and I love that about the Lord. And so our, our takeaway here, right, as we see God's, God's faithfulness to his promise right, as we read in verse 12, that he gave to Jehu uh, and to his descendants, even in the midst of, of kingdoms that rejected him, and um, they paid the price, right, God was faithful, and I love that about the Lord, and our takeaway here is that uh, realize that those who choose to remain outside of Christ, right, because that's, that's a choice that, that people have, right? To follow Jesus is a choice. And likewise, not to follow Jesus is a choice that people have, right? And so, but those who choose to not follow Jesus may enjoy some of God's blessings, right? The, the sun comes up every day, whether you believe in Jesus or not, right? There, there's great privileges about living in this land that, that we enjoy, right? Blessings from God that we enjoy we, regardless of whether or not we believe in Jesus, right? So the, those who choose to remain outside of Christ, though, might enjoy many of God's blessings, but, but cannot claim God's promises for his people, right? Often, uh, you know, we, we see here, right, God was faithful to his word, right, even to those uh, who, who follow Jehu, who, who rejects him, God is still faithful to his word, which is why it just makes sense to follow Jesus, right? Follow Jesus, who God's word points us to. Follow the principles that God has laid out for us uh, in his word. But jump with me real quick over to uh, the book of Romans chapter 8. You don't ever want to believe something I say just because I say it. Let's look at God's word, right? Romans 8, 28, right? We often quote this verse. It's what I call refrigerator magnet verse, right? It's just a great, a meme verse or a meme verse, depending on what you say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Meme, I had to learn. Um, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Man, that's a promise. I hope as followers of Jesus, you hang on to, that you wake up in the morning and you believe that, right? We know that all things, that, that, that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, right? And he goes on, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to them, right? So the idea there is all things work together, for the good for those who follow the Lord. That's a promise specifically to believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now, there's great blessings to everybody, regardless of whether we follow Jesus or not. Right? There's many great, great blessings. But God's promises, you know, th this is a verse that can't be uh, claimed by a a a someone who doesn't follow the Lord. It clearly says there, Right, that we know that for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so it's important to realize that back in our study, right, as we see God's faithfulness, even in the midst of rebellious people, him keeping his promise, right, but still severe consequences for those who continued to refuse to reject him. Now, in some cases, right, God's grace is, is so amazing that, it, that he allows it to continue for a long time. I think it was D.L. Moody who was preaching on the street corner, and a guy came up to him, and he said, oh, I, I, if God's real, I'm going to give him 60 seconds to strike me down dead. God, and he sort of started yelling at the sky and counted 60 seconds, and he 
he said, see, God's not real. And he goes, what blows my, D.L. Moody said something to the effect of, what really blows my mind is that you think that God's grace could be, could, could be done away with in just 60 seconds, right? Try 60 years, you think of God's grace and how, how often he extends it and how long he extends it for so many, but there's no guarantees, right? There's no guarantees for those who reject Christ that today isn't their last day. No guarantees for us that do. Just a big difference in, you know, smoking or non-smoking uh, in, into eternity, right? And, and, and it's so important to, to uh, enjoy the, and, and, and take those promises of the Lord to heart, first and foremost, to follow him. And these folks, by the way, in, in our passage, just like when the nation of Israel, a lot of people struggle with the book of Joshua and, and the conquest of the land of Canaan because of whole cities being wiped out, whole people groups being wiped out. And in fact, God told Joshua, don't make any alliances, right? Remember, they got deceived by, you know, a group. And, but he said, don't make alliances. And it's, and it's not because God didn't love those people. He had given them, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries to repent and to follow him. But it's just like a, a rabid dog. Right? You, you have a rabid dog running around a schoolyard or a neighborhood. You don't say, oh, poor dog. Right? You know, going around biting people, biting kids. You don't say, oh, that poor dog here, I'll take it home and take care of it. If you want to take it home, fine. But the best thing to do is to put that dog down. Right? Because it's going to die anyways, just like, like uh, uh, the brutality we see here of, of these people. Right? And so God was using the nation of Israel in the book of Joshua to judge people who had rejected them, and just like a rabid dog were destroying those around them, right? And, and so it's, it's the most merciful thing, right, that, that we can do. And the best thing for society, right, as tragic as it might be for that dog, right, but the reality is if you don't, it's going to destroy others. And so similarly here, that's, that's why God uh, allows judgment to come in some cases is to protect people, so realize that those who, who choose to remain outside of Christ may enjoy some of God's blessings, but can't claim the promises that are for his people. And so the solution, the takeaway, follow Jesus, right? If you're listening online, I look around here, I know, you know, but if you're listening online and you haven't come to Christ or as, as we're interacting with loved ones and, and, and family who haven't come to Christ, that's the solution, come to Christ. Enjoy the promises of God from from his word, the peace, right? The, the, the spiritual well-being, right? His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Enjoy the Lord. And the last but not least, as we uh, continue on in verse 19, learn to place your trust in the Lord and his ways rather than looking to mankind for answers, right? Learn to place your trust in the Lord and in his ways rather than looking to mankind for the answers. And we'll see here, uh, unfortunately, to their demise, kings doing that. Pick it up in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 19. Paul, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and men of him gave Paul a thousand talents of silver that he might help him to confirm his hold on the royal power. Men of him exacted the money from Israel, that is, from all the wealthy men, 50 shekels of silver from every man to give to the king of Assyria, so the king of Assyria turned back and did not uh, stay there in the land. Now the rest of the deeds of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekaliah, his son, reigned in his place. So the, the, the king of Assyria was coming against him, and he offered to pay him. Right? You, don't, you don't see him seeking the Lord. God, what should I do? In fact, we'll read uh, as we continue on through kings. We'll see where Isaiah or, or other prophets right, were were encouraging the, the kings to stand to trust in the Lord, and, and often they would follow this tragic example and, and resort to carnal means, to, you know, to, to turning to mankind, right, rather than simply trusting in the Lord. And uh, that's exactly what they did here. He, he, he paid, uh, kind of became a tributary, if you will, paid this, uh, the king of Syria to help him uh, uh, maintain control uh, rather than, than trusting in the Lord. In the 50th year of Azariah, verse 23, king of Judah, Pekaliah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. And he reigned two years. Another you know, short reign. You know, you think about the, the lifespan of kings of the northern kingdom. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which 
he made Israel to sin. And Pekah, the son of Remaliah, his captain, conspired against him with 50 men of the people of Gilead and struck him down in Samaria in the citadel of the king's house with Argob and Ariah. He put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Pekaliah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah the son of Ramaliah began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tigilath Pelesier, king of Assyria, came and captured Ijon, Abel, Beth, Mecca, Jonah, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried the people captive to Assyria. Then Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and struck him down and put him to death and reigned in his place. In the twentieth year of Jotham, the king of Uzziah, now the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So again, rising and falling of the kings. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old, uh, which he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Remember, much more predominant in the southern kingdom, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Nevertheless, once again, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Ahaz, his son, reigned in this place. And we'll, as we continue on next week, we'll see how that's responded to. But, but we see this um, tendency and unfortunate tendency in practice rather than to seek the Lord, right, through his servants, right, rather than to trust the Lord to gain victory, they would have these alliances, these allegiance, in many cases, pay off uh, uh, other kingdoms around them and trust in the hand of man rather than trusting in the Lord uh, by trying to buy uh, uh, favor and it was rather unsuccessful. Jump. Real quick over to Ephesians chapter 4, right? Because we can be tempted in similar ways, right? To trust in the ways of mankind. Trust in the, the maybe practices uh, around us rather than turning to the Lord. Because that's where faith comes in, right? That's where the rubber meets the road. Is am I going to respond and trust the Lord by responding and making decisions in accordance with God's will rather than with my own right devices or maybe the world's counsel the way well everybody's doing it that way right in Ephesians chapter 4 pick it up in verse 17 now Paul says now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds they are darkened in their understanding, right? So they don't, you know, those Gentiles would be a reference to like non-believers, right? Who don't have an understanding of the things of God, right? It's, it's not important. They're not pursuing the things of God, right? They're, they're dark and they need the light, right? And that's where we come in, right? The, Jesus is the light of the world and we reflect him into the world, right? They're darkened in their understanding. The, the, the Gentiles, non-believers, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, right? Just the unknowing. And, you know, that's so true today, right? We, we can, um, it can be easy, I think, for some Christians, unfortunately, to take almost an adversarial approach to non-believers when, in many cases, they just simply don't know, right? And they just need to know. They need someone to lovingly and, 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 and gently show them the truth, right? They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, to greedy, uh, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Man, that's all over. Right, that's the whole uh, process for, for some, right? How bad can we get, it seems like, some w would choose to live. You know, there, there's people today that don't really stand for anything in particular except don't tell me what to do, right? And that, that's no way to live. We, we need to live 
based upon God's principles. He designed us. He knows what's best for us. Uh, but he says, that's not the way you learned Christ, right? Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, right? Our old way of living, meaning the life of the flesh, the life before Christ, right? The life uh, of, our, of our natural, carnal, human responses. He describes that as putting that off because it's a decision we make every day, right? And... Uh, which belongs to your former manner of life and, and is corrupted through deceitful desires, right? You don't have to teach a baby how to say no, right? Anybody ever ex- realize that? You don't have to teach a baby how to say no. They learn it. They know it, right? Or, or how to express their displeasure, right? That's just natural. You know, obedience has to be taught. But um, so you put off the old way in verse 23, be, be renewed, in the spirit of your minds, right? In other words, making decisions that, it, that is consistent, right? And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and life. So put off our old way of living. Put off our, our, our natural, carnal, you know, selfish, uh, fleshly tendencies and put on Christ, right? Put on living the way that God would have us live. Man's way, God's way. And the eternal uh, uh, decision that we, ha- that we make, right? To live accordance. And then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, probably on the same page there, right? Realize that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine, right? As we do uh, uh, surrender our lives to Him, as we place our trust in Him, and not in the world system, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can imagine a lot. <laughs> and God's able to do even more. So enjoy the Lord. Trust, place our, our trust and our faith in Him and be blessed. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll pray. Father, thank you so much for the great hope that we have in you, Lord. And thank you for these lessons here, Lord, in some cases, what not to do, uh, Lord, uh, but clearly principles that we can apply to our lives, Lord, to be blessed in 2020. Thank you that, that our blessing is not based upon merely our circumstances, but it's rooted and grounded in Christ, who has overcome death, in, in whom there is great hope, Lord. So we thank you for that. But I ask that today you would be radically and wonderfully glorified. I, I pray for uh, my brothers and sisters here, live and in person and online, Lord, uh, maybe even around the world, that, Lord, you would just just meet each of us where we're at. Lord, that you would, would fill us uh, afresh with your Holy Spirit and empower us to go from here as lights of the world. God, thank you that you give us the great honor and privilege of being a part of your kingdom and of your work here on earth. And, Lord, you've called us in unique ways. And Lord, may we be faithful to Step out and trust you in those ways for your glory as we seek to bring your love and your hope to this world who is in desperate need of it. We thank you so much, Lord, and we bless your name. And we, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Just wanted to say hello and thank you for joining us today at Calvary Chapel Living Hope here online. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's been a while for some since you've been able to be down here live with us, but we love you just the same and are are super blessed to have you uh, watch on on Facebook or perhaps on the YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to that, I encourage you to do that. We uh, put out uh, updates uh, a few times a week and uh, are looking forward to uh, continuing to do that. And so anyways, we just wanted to say hello to those of us who join us live on uh, online and just uh, really, really thankful that that you do that. And I know that it's sort of... uh, Unusual time, certainly, in, in, our, in our country, uh, but uh, we're so blessed to be able to, to touch base this way, and, you know, even though maybe you're not here in person, absolutely just as much part of the fellowship as anybody else, and so thanks so much. Uh, look forward to hopefully touching base throughout the week. Feel free to reach out if there's anything we can do for you, and uh, God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hope you are blessed and that you found two or three nuggets that you can apply to your walk with the Lord this week and and be blessed. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, click on the blue dove. 
and hit subscribe. Click on the notification button for future content so we can connect more often throughout the week. God bless you and thank you again for joining us.